Hello, today is November 16th, 2013. We're meeting today with Mr. Bart Bartholomew to talk about his military experiences in the Navy. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bart, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Well, thanks for inviting me, Brad. I really appreciate this. This you, is going to be fun. You bet. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you're born, a little bit about your family. Okay. Uh, born July 14th, 1948, uh, eastern Colorado, in a little town called Stratton, which is about uh, 20-some miles from the Kansas state line. And Gr Grew up in Burlington, which is uh, 18 miles from... Uh, from Stratton, so they were very close in proximity. No hospital in Burlington, no hospital in Stratton, so I was uh, I was born in a in a house with a midwife. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, brothers and sisters? Yeah, I've got one older brother. Uh, he's eight years older than I am. His name is Leroy, and I got a sister who's six years older. Her name is Deanna, and they're one lives in Colorado and one lives in Texas. Okay. And what'd your dad do for for a living? My my dad was a was a truck driver. Uh, my mom and him separated when I was four years old, and she remarried to a, a gentleman by the name of Carl Lindholm, and uh, he raised me from five until he passed away when I was a, a junior in high school. Mm. And uh, but my dad and I stayed in contact through years, and and he lived in Denver until his passing in in 1971. Okay. Okay. So you went up, went through the school system there in Burlington, yes. and graduated from high school. Yeah. Uh, what year did you graduate? 1967. 1967. Okay. And um, take your story from there. What'd you do once you got out of high school? Uh, pretty cut and dry. Got my draft notice. Uh, oh, right off the bat. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, graduated in June and, and uh, got my notice from Selective Service in July, and. Uh, Knew the draft meant Army, and uh, I had a dad, my, well, my dad was in the Army in World War II. Uh, my brother served uh, in the Navy. Uh, he was in between Korea and, and Vietnam. As a matter of fact, a little quick story. He wanted to know how come I had a ribbon when I come out of boot camp. He spent three years in there and didn't get anything. And I said, <laughs> I can't explain it. I'm just, I'm just part of the Navy. It's part of the system. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, signed, went, went across the state line into, into Kansas because there was a recruiter over there and asked him if there was uh, any chance of signing up for the Navy. And he said, yeah, there's a good chance. So I signed my, my name on the dotted line, went to Denver, got inducted. August of 67, went to San Diego, joined the Navy, went to boot camp. Uh, came home on my, on my two-week leave and then uh, got my duty assignment to the USS Valley Forge, which at that time was stationed in Long Beach, California. So, uh, backing up, uh, getting in the Navy was an influence by the fact you didn't want to go to the Army, and because your brother had served in the Navy. I mean, well, yeah, Dad had uh, never wanted to talk about his, his military service, and uh, as I've grown older, I, I understand why. You know, World War II was a, uh, a very sad time for. The American people and all the men and women who served in, in World War II, so uh, I respect the fact that he didn't want to talk. Well, when my, my brother joined the Navy, I was still a young boy at yeah, home. Right. When he would come home, all, all I heard was, was fun stories and the parties and, and uh, the travel he made and, and travels he made. And So I thought, you know, if I got my chances, I'd, I'd rather serve on ship and, right. and uh Nothing against serving my country in, 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 in the war, right. but I knew I could probably uh, contribute some other way. That's, yeah. that's pretty much the choice I made, I made. Fair enough, yeah, yeah. And, and how was that transition going from civilian life to, to military life? Was that much of a transition? Oh yeah, it was, it was quite different when uh, you're used to being able to sleep in and, yeah. and uh, go to the icebox and, and get what you wanted uh, any time of the day or night and, and then being regulated to... Uh, an exact time to go to bed, exact time to get up, exact time to eat, and, and same food every time. Well, not every time, but you, you, when you went to the, uh, the, the, I think what it was called, uh, chow, chow uh -huh. line. Yeah. Uh, the stuff was put on there, and you either ate it, or you went hungry, yeah. because there wasn't any place to, to go get uh, snacks. So it was quite quite a transition, and, and the fact that they was they was making you become a part of the military. They was, uh, some people really, it made it pretty easy for them to uh, adapt to the military ways. Others, it was uh, a big resistance and, 
and they're the ones that was pretty much picked on all the time or, or hollered at all the time by your your company commander. So, yeah, it, I, I made it pretty good. I I towed the line and did what they said, and I marched when they told me to march, and, and uh, got along with the with the Navy pretty good. And how was it uh, here growing up on the plains of Colorado, small town? Uh, I don't imagine you traveled a whole lot. Now you're on the West Coast in San Diego, uh, away from home. Was there any sort of tinge of homesickness or anything along that lines? Or no, I can't really say there was, Brad. I I, uh, I I took to the water pretty good, if you want to say the that we'll term, do. because that's a good cliche. Yeah. Uh, got out there with with a whole bunch of other guys I never met in my life, and they right. came from all all walks of life, right, from different right. states, yeah. and and I even had one guy that just served four years in the army, got out of the army and got on every discharge and joined the Navy and he was boot camp right on, all over again so he really liked the military but he must have wanted four more years of it because that's what he did so I adapted really well didn't get homesick uh, missed my family I was single yeah. uh, had a girlfriend uh, and that's a story in itself I I was one of those unlucky guys that got the Dear John letter when I was overseas uh, rebounded and, and uh, didn't, didn't bother me uh, as much as it did some people because it was tragic on, on some of the men that were over there and got those letters because uh, they they didn't come home sometimes. Wow. So and that was that happened aboard my ship a couple of different times that you would you would hear the call of a man overboard and and, uh, and you would hear through the scuttlebutt that uh, it was so and so from such and such division and he got a letter from his girlfriend or his wife or whatever or found some bad news and couldn't take it and, and uh, jumped overboard. Wow. And uh, I can't remember how many times it happened, but it, it happened too many times. One, once is too many. Wow. Wow. So, but uh, but the Navy, the ship did everything it could. I mean, uh, it, it stopped, it, it turned around, and, and I'm, on a, I'm on a light aircraft carrier, so it, you, you can't turn around like you can in a car in, in an intersection. I mean, it takes you a while to do that. And the helicopter went up, so anyway, that's a, yeah. that's a whole different yeah. Whole different part of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you finish boot camp. Uh, you get a furlough home then, or yeah. you go on to training, uh, additional training from there. No, I, I, I had signed up uh, for schools to, uh, or, or courses to, to get onto submarines when I first got the oh. navy, and uh, I, th I had a buddy, uh, Dean Gray, that was a, a submariner, submariner, and I talked to him several times, and he seemed to like submarines, and, and I thought, well, you know, hey. Never, never been in the underwater, other than swimming once in a while. So I thought, hey, let's do that. But I didn't score high enough. So when I got out of basic training, I, I was assigned directly to a, to a ship, uh, on the west the west coast, and I knew the west coast mean there's a good chance for me going uh, over to the, the Asia, which is Vietnam. So I went home on my boot camp leave and did all my things and saw all my friends from high school and uh, told them what I was doing and. and uh, Two weeks later, I was in Long Beach, California, and uh, walked aboard the gangplank of the USS Valley Forge, and, and it's an amphibious assault ship. Uh, got all checked in and went up to the flight deck, and it was daytime, and, and uh, first time I'd been on a on a big boat. I'd been on some small rowboats and yeah, motor right, boats right. and stuff, but got on that thing and got on the flight deck and just looking around, and all of a sudden, the horizon disappeared because we're even though we're moored, oh, right. the, the boat will still go up and down a little bit. So I see the horizon, I'm like, wow, this is what it's like sitting still? What's it going to be like when we get out to sea? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and we're told about seasickness and then things that we could do. And, and uh, so once we left port for our first uh, tour to Vietnam, which is called a Westpac, uh, I fared real well. I, really? I no, did, well, you got your I sea did, legs. I mean, I, for a yep, yep, never got never got seasick. Uh, small. Watched a lot of a lot of poor sailors, uh, heads over the cans, and they were just sick from the time we left until probably I, well days. You know, poor, poor guys just couldn't couldn't handle it. Huh. They was in sick bay all the time, but they they eventually got over it. I don't know what they had to do to get over it, but they did. But I never had a problem with that, so I was very thankful. Boy, from uh, the. Landlocked prairies of Colorado had no oh, problem going to sea. Yeah, huh. I I really fared well. I you know I I can't say that there was anything that interrupted my my lifestyle 
uh, from the plains of Colorado to the seas of the Pacific and uh, the, the Los Angeles County and Long Beach, all the big big uh, towns out there in California because we didn't go right away. I, I, I uh, went aboard the ship in uh, November of 67 and uh, I think it was probably two or three weeks, maybe four weeks before we left. So I had I had liberty and, and time to go aboard or go go uh, to land and, and see the town and stuff like that and meet, meet people and so chummed up with some guys right away and, and made some good friends and I was in a, an outfit, I was assigned to an outfit called Combat Cargo. Combat Cargo was a uh, 10 or 15 guys. We worked for a Marine Corps sergeant. We were oh, in really? the Navy, but we yeah. worked for a Marine Corps sergeant. He was a gunnery sergeant at the time, uh, Jeff Barnett. And our boss was uh, Captain James Puckett. He was also a Marine. And what we would do is we would uh, take on cargo when we was either at sea or at port and store that cargo in different compartments in the, in the ship for later use to deploy into Vietnam when we when we got close to, to Vietnam and we would either put them on on boats offloaded by cranes or we would put them on the flight deck and cover them up with tarps and then hook them all together and then we had a big old plastic stick that uh, we would take and hook to the bottom of the helicopter as it was hovering over and I got some pictures in the book that oh, excellent. kind of shows that uh -huh. and then uh, as it hooked up we would step aside and the aircraft would first raise so they wouldn't go forward and drag it because they always had to get it off the deck making sure they didn't tip over the whatever cargo we had hooked up on there. So they would raise it and once they cleared we would show them the, the clearance sign and the way they'd fly and then we would wait for the next one. We did this with every, everything that you could think of from, from water to food to clothing to, to uh, military jeeps to huh. trucks and trucks we would we would pretty much offload on, on bigger bigger barges but uh, then we would also go down to the hangar deck when uh, the troops, the, we had close to 1500 Marine Corps troops on, on board with us at all times, at any one given time because they were going in to take care of uh, other, other Marines that needed to be relieved so uh, we would send them in on helicopters inside the ship and I got a picture of how they would march out and, and get on in behind the helicopter and, and uh, get on board and away they would go. And, hmm. And, uh, hmm. How far off the coast would you guys uh, be then? When oh, you were there? And anyone, you, they, we never docked. There was no place yeah. to dock in yeah. Vietnam, so we would anchor and we was sometimes a quarter of a mile away. Really? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, if there was any, any evidence that there was going to be some sort of uh, uh, a strike of any kind of, of any vessel, a, 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 toward any vessel, they would ask us to go out a little farther to be out of range, but uh, it wasn't uh, anything like World War II where yeah. uh, the Japanese and the, the Germans had big enough guns right. to, to shoot at ships out to sea, so we didn't have to stay out quite that far, so, but uh, I could always see land, pretty much, hmm. uh, see the coast coastline of Vietnam. Hmm. What what was it like? Uh, I mean, these these things are basically floating cities. I mean, here you're on this thing that's with a population five, six, seven times the size of Burlington. I mean, well, what, talk a little bit about life on on a, on a carrier and sleeping conditions, food, entertainment, uh, just general life on an, on a carrier like that. Well, uh, it's it's very interesting. You you bring that up because uh, the the hometown of Burlington had like. Uh, 2,500 people uh, as a population, and uh, the complement of men on, on the Valley Forge was uh, about 1,500, but we had also 12 to 1,500 Sorry. Marine Corps in there, so we had twice as many people on this ship uh, than, than we did in my hometown. Yeah. So when I found that out, I thought, whoa, I got more people here than I had at hometown. So. <laughs> Uh, and I don't know everybody in my hometown, so how am I going to get to know everybody here? <laughs> and I didn't. I never did get to meet everybody. But uh, a ship's very interesting because there's there's no signs like you get into a, a, a big building and it, it gives you arrows or whatever and, and somebody gives you directions. All ladders, no elevators, no no escalators, you know, and the, and the ladders are not sloped at a, a gradual. They're pretty much straight up and 
And uh, if anybody's ever seen any pictures of, of war movies where they see them sliding down the, the handrails, that's pretty much what you did. Uh, and it took me probably a good month to not get lost. Wow. To find all the offices that I had to, to go to. Uh, I made sure I knew where the mess deck, that's what I was looking for. The mess deck, I knew where it was, I knew where sick bay was, and I knew where I was supposed to sleep. I made sure I found those three pretty quick when I got on board. All the other ones would come later and somebody could help me, but uh, I made sure I knew where to eat and if I got hurt I could go and get some medical attention and, and where I needed to sleep. So, uh, But it was big, and uh, but it wasn't that big, and I'll, I'll explain that why it's not that big. Uh, when I said it was a light carrier, when we got, before we even got to Vietnam, we stopped in uh, in the Philippines and we anchored, there's no place to, to, to uh, dock at the mm -hmm. anchor in, in, in the Phillips either, so we always anchored. And we was in a, in a place called uh, Subic Bay, and uh, the USS Enterprise, which was a nuclear aircraft carrier, pulled in right after us. And I looked at the size of the, the, the Enterprise compared to the size of the Valley Forge, and I made a comment to a, an old salt that was uh, been on for a while, and I said, wow. I said, I thought I was on a big ship, and he says, don't worry. He says, we're going to nurse off the Enterprise, and we're going to grow up and be great big, too. <laughs> so I, I always like to tell that, that we, we had a chance to be big, too, but we could nurse off the Enterprise. Uh, no, it was it was, a, it was a city. It was big. I mean, it, it had everything. It had a post office, and had a commissary, a store, and, and uh, so you had everything that you, that you needed. And we made our own water. We would take salt water on and uh, whatever they did to it. I, I wasn't involved in that, so I don't yeah. know what they did, but they uh, cleaned up the salt water and then we had drinking water because when you're out to sea for, you know, weeks upon sometimes months, right, uh, right. you have to be able to have the food now, or the, the water supply. But there was times that we ran out of water. The, the, the complement of, of water was, was used up when we were sitting out at, uh, at anchor because when we would go to Vietnam, we would we would probably stay anchored out there for well two or three days. And then we would we would go out, you know, get away from it, change our position, and come back in. Uh, but we wouldn't we wouldn't dock or, or go to a, a port for a couple months. Wow! So you, when we needed food, we would go out to sea, meet cargo ships, and then we re, we would re, re, replenish by ships being side by side shooting a light over with a gun and they would grab the rope bring it over and then we get all the big stuff and then we could even cur or ferry people across mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so it was interesting watching watching yeah, the place. Always, and i was always involved in that because yeah. i was i was taking care of the cargo right 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 so i drove a forklift while i was on the on the on the valley forge and and uh, uh the, the biggest challenge with the forklift was we would take on munitions bullets uh big rounds, little rounds, and uh, they were not always banded. So every once in a while, I had a friend of mine who worked with me at Congo Combat Cargo, he was on a different shift than I was, he said he dropped a, a, a box of, not the pineapple grenades, but the round grenades or the canisters, and after that, nothing could come on board a ship without being banded. But uh, could you imagine what would happen if something would discharge? and? Because we had helicopters underneath there, we had fuel in these helicopters. Uh, it could be very ca uh, catastrophic. So, uh, and and the Valley Forge is purely helicopters, or did you have uh, planes? Helicopters in, in Vietnam. Before that, it was a CVA forty-five. Mine was an LPH eight. And in Korea, they had fixed wing helicopter, oh. fixed wing aircraft, but they converted in the sixties to uh, uh, adapt to the Vietnam War conflict. And what, uh, talk a little bit about uh, your living conditions as far as sleeping quarters and, and uh, talk a little bit about food and just... Uh, my living quarters was right underneath the flight deck on the uh, port no, side of the no, ship. No. Uh, due to the fact that that was where we worked, we needed to be close to where we worked. If you was a, a machinist mate, you was probably below decks. If you was a, a fireman, you was below decks. Uh, uh, the black stripers, which I, that's what I was, we was either on in around the hangar deck or below the, the flight deck, but I was I was right below the flight deck. We had uh, 12 racks, which were beds, uh, 
they all hung from the overhead, you didn't call it a ceiling, and they had a chain that would come down to the first rack, and then there would be a chain below that rack to the next rack, and there was there was three racks here, three racks on the other side, and then all all up and down for for twelve people. We had our own lockers in in the early navy they, they would have to lift up their rack and that's where all their clothing would be. So you couldn't be in the rack when you get your clothing or if someone was up on top you had to make sure that somebody wasn't there to where you could lift it up. But anyway, pretty easy to get to, had, had pretty good sized lockers and, and uh, but they were uh, think of the word, I had, I had to polish them. Uh, it wasn't brass, it was silver. Stainless steel. Stainless steel and, and uh, so in the Navy everything had to be spit polished. Uh -huh. All your boots and all your shoes and, and uh, all your brass and, and all your lockers. So, But living quarters were pretty easy uh, but the commander of the mess deck was uh, below the flight deck, below the hangar deck, about, about two decks below the, the, the hangar deck so it took a while to get down there and, and several stairs. Uh, during a replenishment time, and, and uh, I was about three decks below, and we have decks and then we have hatches. When you lift them up, they're they're not doors, or but we this this hatch had was three thousand pounds, and what you would do is you would hook it with a, a a ball and tackle, hook it to the overhead, then you would raise it up so far, and then you would put a metal stopper underneath the the deck and the and the hatch. Well, one day we was doing that, and I was running the ball and tackle, and we was getting ready to get it to I get the bulkhead so I could raise it up the rest of the way. And uh, one of the guys put a a wooden what they call a foxtail, it's a wisp broom, that we cleaned the floor with, dustpan and stuff. He put that in there as a wedge instead of this piece of steel. And when I reached over to grab the ball and tackle, take it off of the uh, the the hatch, my feet were over the oh, edge oh, geez. and the wood broke and the hatch came down to my feet and we didn't have steel toe shoes or anything like that I'm kind of glad it would I didn't at that time because where it hit the steel the 3,000 pound hatch would have came down it was probably open two to three feet well it did some damage to my my toes and, and I was on crutches for <laughs> an awful long time and that's that's probably the biggest problem I had when I was on board that aircraft carrier on your ship it was getting up down stairs on crutches. <laughs> right. So the way I would do it is I would give somebody my crutches and then I would hop up one step at a time until I got up and then I'd do the same thing coming down. So I always had to have somebody with me because the, 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 the stairs were so narrow you, you couldn't uh, you couldn't use a like you can with regular yeah, steps. So. Right. But that was, I can't remember how long I was on crutches, but way too long. It, Oh, it, sounds, it was an inconvenience. For uh, a while. It sounded painful. I mean, it well, it, it hurt. Uh -oh. uh, fortunately, it did. It didn't get my foot. It just got my toes. If it got my foot, it would crush my foot. But uh, I, I had a bunch of sharp guys working with me because when that happened, I, I, I would say seconds that they had that thing off hmm. me, and I, I, I don't remember, but I don't think it was with a ball and tackle. I think they lifted it up. You know, and, and adrenaline is an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure they just got underneath it because there was enough. With my foot still there, there was enough that they could get underneath there. I, I can't remember. I don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. I, I can't answer that one. There. Wow. Any any reoccurring problems? No, with that? no. I yeah. I healed real well. Really? Yeah. Real, yeah, yeah. I did. Uh, no, no problems. Yeah. So. Yeah. But being being on the ship was was really interesting. I, I really enjoyed it. I met a lot of friends. I got some pictures of some of the guys that I worked with, uh, either in combat cargo and, or some of the people I met in other parts of the ship. And, and when we went and partied, got some pictures of the parties we had in in, in the Philippines, stuff like that, or Japan. So. Well, that must have been fascinating too. I keep going back to the small town boy of eastern Colorado, halfway around the world in these exotic locations. That must have been. Uh... Yeah, I got to, got to go to Yakuska, Japan, uh, across the international date line. And when you do that, you become what they call a shellback. It's a special. Oh, talk you, a little about that. Uh, that get, ceremony. <laughs> you get you get initiated. <laughs> that, uh, uh, I remember when I was a freshman or an eighth grader going into high school, became a freshman. Uh, we had initiation. So <laughs> when I 
when I told I was going to be initiated, uh, I said, can't be any worse than when I was initiated when I was a freshman, but it's a lot worse. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, I mean, they, whatever they could do to make a mess, uh, <laughs> axle grease in your hair and, and wearing women's clothing and and having different names, but uh, it was nobody ever got hurt. One, one guy, uh, I'm trying to remember, he slipped and fell and hit his head and he had to be airlifted. This was my second ship. He mm. had to be airlifted off of the uh, the Paul Revere at that time, that's what I went on, uh, into a, a military hospital because uh, uh, he slipped on some grease or some, some something, but it uh, wasn't anything that they was doing to him that hurt him. But, yeah. uh, so I'd been to uh, Sydney, Australia, that's where we ended up. Came back up in uh, Japan and, and uh, Thailand and uh, Philippines and Okinawa, you know, just a lot of different places, you know. And there's all beautiful countries when you got in and, and the people loved, loved the Americans. I mean, we really we were treated nicely, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, you had to pretty much stay on the on the main street, you were told never to, to go down the alleys or, or being taken in by somebody who wanted to show you something that they was a native, you, you just stayed away from that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, right, 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 right. They told that to every military uh, person who ever went on any R&R, &R rest and relaxation tour, so. But, uh, yeah, and everything was uh, a lot cheaper over there, so people would always ask the, the sailors to pick something up to them that, uh, Electronics, cameras, mm -hmm. and TVs and stuff, or not TVs, but uh, computers and, and uh, cameras and stuff, and then ship them home, you know, because it was so much cheaper mm -hmm. than it was uh, in the States. So, did a lot, a lot for, for a lot of folks. Mm. So, how long would, would a normal tour? You said you, you did, what, three tours? You've well, got two tours, and then I, I uh, got a got out of my second tour because of an emergency situation oh. with my dad. So I did I did a full tour, one tour, part of the second tour, started a third tour. So I would say combined a tour and a half, totally, but I, but I started three. Uh, are, 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 uh, tour is standard, I mean, time-wise, is there a standard amount of time there, or is it, it, it vary? It, it varies yeah. from, from military uh, service members, like the Army might be, a year, might be eight months, okay. uh, uh, Air Force, uh, Marine Corps, they're all a little right. different. I can't speak for them, yeah. but mine, I left in, I think, December of 67. We came back in June or July of, of 68, oh, wow. and then got everything taken care of on the ship, got all the, the things repaired, and then we went again 68. And, and then I came back for another emergency. I'll tell you about these emergencies. Yeah. My, my, my dad had a heart attack in December of 67 when I first got over there. And uh, we was in Vietnam, so the Red Cross got a hold of me. I flew into Da Nang, uh, got an aircraft, shoot, went to Okinawa, went to the States, came, saw my dad. Didn't have time to put my civilian clothing together that I had on the ship, so when I came to the United States, all I had oh, was one of the clothes that I was wearing. Oh, geez. Well, uh, since I wasn't living with my dad, I didn't have the, the the ability to get any clothes from him. My brother also lived in the Denver metro area. So when I saw my dad the first night that I got there, uh, he was not really doing real well, so I wanted to go home to my hometown of Burlington, pick up some civilian clothes, come back, which I did. While in Burlington, anybody from a small town knows what dragging Main Street meant. I yeah. uh, don't know if they still do it in the 2000s, but they did it in the 60s and 50s and 70s. Anyway, I was dragging Main with a friend of mine and, and his wife was driving my car, and there was a car from Kansas that had two girls in it, and everybody honks and waves at everybody. Yeah. Nobody, nobody's a stranger in any small town. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I told my friend, I said, TL, I said, those two girls want to meet me. I could just tell. <laughs> we had one stoplight in Burlington, so at that next stoplight, I said, TL, if it turns red, you come over and drive, I'm going to go up and get in that car. <laughs> well, I did. When I got in the car, I 
I said, hi. Told him my name, and or I started telling my name, and this one girl on the right said, you don't have to do that. I know who you are. So she said my name, and I'm thinking, oh, this is not good. <laughs> if she knows who I am, I, I don't stand a chance of dating either one. But anyway, uh, the driver was the older sister. She was home from Kansas from, from college on Christmas break. We ended up riding around together with my friends that night, and the little sister went home. So we finished the night, and I, I started writing letters to her, and she started writing back. So December of 69, we met. 68, we met again, and in 69, we got married. Oh, wow. So, oh, great story. So actually three dates, and that was 40, June would be 45 years. <laughs> so I told my dad, after he came out of that, the heart surgery and then a heart transplant later on, uh, that it's because of him and his medical problems that I met my wife. And he says, Keep her, because I ain't doing it again for you. <laughs> right. so, so I did. So I, I, I kept her. Uh, but that was one, one emergency leave. And then I had another one that I had to go on because he had open heart surgery. And then later on, after I was married, he had uh, a heart transplant. So, uh, yeah, three dates and, and uh, about a year and a half. And, and uh, we got married and didn't know each other. And, and it was me jumping in the backseat of your car. So. Wow. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it should point out at this point, uh, anybody that watches it, I mean, back in the day, you didn't have cell phones and computers oh. and instant messaging. And this was purely, I imagine, done by primarily by letter. I would assume an occasional phone call maybe. but There never was a phone call unless I got to the States. So yeah. it was all letters. And speaking of letters, we have every letter that, really? her, that yeah. her and I wrote. We still have them in a box. And it got to a problem that I told her that I said, start numbering your letters. Because I'm reading a letter, and it's telling me something, and then three letters down, because I'll get six or seven letters at a time. Okay. Uh -huh. Because that's how, how, how late the mail gets to us. Yeah, right. And so I would read a letter, and oh, wow. And I read a letter that led up to this. So I told her, I said, you're going to have to start uh, numbering the letters, and I'll do the same thing, because we, we never know if this batch of letters gets hung up over here, and this one <laughs> catches it and passes. So, but... Uh, we, we want to break out those letters sometime and start Oh, writing. absolutely. My penmanship was to, so bad back in the 60s, I, I never was very good at a, at a writer, so I'm afraid that when we get to my letters, I'm not going to be able to read them. <laughs> it would be a challenge, it would be kind of fun, but yeah, we've got every letter, so that's, that's cool too. Wow. wow. And we had, we had two daughters from the marriage, and, and uh, we had five grandkids, but uh, God, I just love each and every one of them. Uh, both daughters, uh, one daughter's married, one daughter's single at this particular time. Uh, but back to the, the, the Navy, I want to get yeah. back to the oh, Navy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm wandering around trying to think where, where I want to go. My, my best part of my career was on the Valley Forge. That was the hardest part of my career, too. And I say career, it was only three years and, and seven months, but still, it was, to me, it was, a, it was a long time. So because you enlisted, you had a four-year tour? Right. Or right, a term? Right. Okay. And uh, uh, Combat Cargo also served as a, a temporary hospital ship and also a temporary mortuary. Uh, and that was probably the hardest part of my, my time on the Valley Forge because, as I told you earlier, that we would help disembark the Marines on these helicopters and send them into harm's way. Right, right, right. They were they were loaded up with all their 50 pounds of backpack and their guns and, and everything they was going in to protect everybody back home and us. And then, boy, weeks, weeks after my first deployment of, of many, many Marines, uh, 1,500 of them, we were starting to get injured back and, and uh, there were two hospital ships out there one was called the Repose, and I can't remember the other one, but they were regular floating hospitals, and they could take on hundreds upon hundreds of, of, of injured uh, servicemen and women. And we would take these, these injured on, and our sick bay wasn't big enough, so we would have to have makeshift hospital beds and stuff like that on the, on the hangar deck. And not only did they do that, but we would have to take off the off the dead and uh, the KIA the killed in action and uh, they would they would be in body bags if anybody heard the term body bags it was just a big plastic bag that had handles on it and, and a zipper and and when uh, 
the people in, in country would uh, get them prepared for uh, being sent away. They didn't have caskets, so they would just put them in, in body bags and send them to certain ships, and I, we had to be one of them. And then we would keep them on, on board the, the aircraft carrier until we could get them to uh, an, uh, close to a, a port where we could get them in to be shipped back home uh, to, to be with their family. So, and I had to stand guard duty on on those those men that uh, didn't make it home, and that was probably the the toughest part of my career. Yeah, that would uh, understandable. Uh, knowing that I put. Some of those guys, yeah. I knew their faces, yeah. didn't know their names. Right. Kids. And I don't know who they were when they when they came in the body bags. I yeah. never looked at tags or anything like that. So that was tough. Yeah, yeah, was, understandable. But you know, after after my second tour, uh, and my my dad had his had his heart his, his open heart surgery, and I was sent back to the states. They didn't send me back to the to the Valley Forge. Uh, the Valley Forge was getting close to its decommission time. Uh, it was christened in, in uh, the 40s and served Korea and Vietnam and it, it served its, its time so yeah. it was going to be put in mothballs. So rather than send me back to my original unit, uh, the combat cargo, I uh, got assigned to San Diego, California and I got assigned to decommission a ship. So uh, since I didn't have a quote a rating like a, a machinist mate, a bosun mate or anything like that, uh, I was still a, just a three striper. I got the dirty job of going down the bilges and, and uh, taking a, a machine and cleaning off all the, all the rust and stuff like that to prepare it to be torn apart and, and made scrap metal. So I did that for about three or four months, got her decommissioned, got an award to the mothball fleet and, and uh, got an award for doing that. Then I got assigned to the, the Paul Revere. The Paul Revere was stationed in San Diego at the time and it was called an LPA. It uh, had a, a little uh, flight deck on the back, on the uh, fo forecastle of the ship to where it could land a helicopter and, and uh, when I got assigned to the the Paul Revere, due to the fact I had some helicopter experience, they took advantage of that. And, and uh, I, when we got, when we, when, when we deployed, when I got married uh, in '69 when my dad had that open heart surgery. Okay. And because I didn't have any more leave time, we had a November wedding plan. I told my wife, Dot, I said, this is going to be the last chance I'm going to be able to come back to here, probably until I'm discharged because I've, I've used up all I leave with, with Dad, and uh, so I think if we're going to get married, we need to do it now. And since I'm backing up a little bit, yeah. I was only 20 years old, and uh, my wife will let me say this, she is a year older than I am. <laughs> so when we went to the city and county building of Denver to get married, to get for a marriage license, I wasn't old enough. Oh, really? <laughs> so I, I looked at the clerk and I said, ma'am, I said, I said, I've just served a full year in Vietnam and I've seen stuff that I've never want to talk about and uh, my president and Uncle Sam told me that I was old enough to be drafted into the military and serve and protect the United States, but I have to have my mother's permission to get married? She says, I'm sorry, but yes. I said, all right. <laughs> Nothing I can do and I wasn't going to forge my mom's name, so I went Drove all the way to Burlington, oh, got my mom's permission, got had her sign the form, we came back and we got married. And unfortunately my wife never get never got the big wedding. We had oh, wow. we had my a, a very good friend from high school and his wife stood up with us and we had the preacher and the secretary of the church. So there were six people at our wedding. Okay, so drove all the way to Burlington and, and uh, told my mom that I needed her permission to get married, told her why. So always there to being Equal, I, we went over to Goodland, Kansas, because that's where my wife was from, and that's where her mother was. Her mother was a, uh, a widow, so we went over there and, and told her and apologized and, and uh, visited with her for a little while. Then we came back to them and got married. So, like I said, it was the best man and, and uh, his wife. So we went to San Diego. I, I, I went back out to San Diego, found out what I was going to be doing, found a place to live, and 
flew back to Colorado, got my bought a car, brought my wife back, and, and we drove out to California. So we was living in San Diego while I was on the USS Winston, which was uh, my actually my second ship. That's the one that we decommissioned and mothballed, and uh, got done with that one. Then I got assigned to the Paul Revere. But once we we stayed in San Diego, we go out to, to sea every once in a while. The wife would stay there, obviously. And then when we got ready to deploy, uh, she had become pregnant, and uh, she was due in August. And we deployed for Vietnam for my last time in August. <sighs> And I did everything I could with the personnel office on the, on the Paul Revere to see if I could get an extension and then fly over. I told them I'd, I'd pay my way. I could meet them in San Diego, but there's just, just no way. They wasn't going to do that. And, and government's a government, you know. They yeah. got rules, and, and uh, I wasn't the first one that uh, uh, military man that had a baby while he was overseas, yeah. So and I won't be the last. So anyway, uh, two weeks after I was, I was gone, I got not notified by... Uh, I guess telegraph, telegram, telegram, that uh, I had a brand new daughter. Oh, my wow. and daughter were doing fine, and, and uh, so, and it was it was three months or over three months before I got to see her in person. That's when I got back to the states. So, uh, got a picture of of me and my wife and my my newborn baby. Uh, when I first got home, I was still in in, in, in navy clothes, and so it was my introduction. And that's a picture that I that I will cherish forever. Oh, absolutely! Meeting, yeah, my, yeah. meeting my daughter for yeah. the first time. So. Oh, wow! But while I was uh, here, I, I digress. Go back to the Paul Revere. Uh, <clears throat> due to the fact that I had some ex helicopter experience, been on it, been in country, uh, they had me go out on on recovery missions of downed aircraft. Mm. Oh, wow! So I would go out there, and I had the experience of hooking up. Uh, gurneys and stretchers, litter, litter, litter uh, carriers and stuff like that uh, with, with bodies on them, either wounded or whatever and uh, did that a couple of different times and, and uh, sad but when, when somebody's been in the water for an awful long time their, their body decays and, and uh, fish often have an opportunity to, to destroy the body so that was a site that uh, will, will be in, embedded into me for, for life. So, uh, one little story that I, I did forget when I came back from my first emergency leave in December of '67 uh, to come back to the Valley Forge, I couldn't get to Da Nang for, for, for one reason or another, and that's where my ship was at the time, and it was headed towards Saigon. So instead of going to Da Nang, the, the ship, the air, airplane I was on, landed in Saigon at the Tonsonute Air Force Base. Well, December 67, January 68 is when Tet Offensive started oh, in right, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so when, I, when we landed, uh, we were under attack with small arm fire. Our airplane was under attack, so uh, the local military unit there had to come out in their, their vehicles and protect us while we was getting off because we're, we're unarmed. We have nothing to protect ourselves with. So we were scurried to the what they call the Annapolis Hotel. It was just a, a building place where they would put military people temporarily while they was getting reassigned to wherever they was going. And I was going to be going back to my, my, my unit on the Valley Forge. Well, I got stuck there for just about two weeks because of Tet Offensive. And uh, I would send, send messages to my ship saying, I'm here, I'm okay, it's just going to take me a while and I'll hook up with the valley whenever I can. And if I refer to it the valley, that's what we, mm -hmm. we, we call the Valley Forge, or the Happy Valley. <laughs> so there was three different times that I was taken from the Annapolis Hotel and placed on the roof of the embassy and given a, a rifle and a 45 really? to protect the em embassy during that particular time. So never, never had to shoot, never got, got shot at. So, uh, but I was, I was there, and uh, being in the Navy, my my shooting was limited, my practice. So uh, I had never shot an M16, shot a 45. So uh, my training on an M16 was. 
here it is. Here's how the clip goes in. Here's the trigger. Here's the safety. So, so uh, and I was with two other sailors that, that had no other, well, I was with one Air Force guy, and none of us had ever had any experience. So we, we weren't combat veterans. We, we didn't know what to do. Wow. And we was really, really, really hoping that the, the Viet Cong didn't get too close to the Annapolis Hotel where they was going to depend on us to protect them. <laughs> wow. we, we was kind of worried. Oh, so uh, when I got back to my ship and told uh, my crewmates that I saved you guys, don't worry. I know how to carry an M16. <laughs> Still don't know how to shoot one, but I carried it. <laughs> so, wow. so that that's my that's my fame story. You know, <laughs> I uh, it was it was quite interesting. I got back and they they said, "Geez, you know, you you really a hero." I said, "Yeah, I really am." I'm scared to death, but yeah, I, I, I I wasn't I wasn't any different than any other seventeen year old. Yeah. And that's all I was, right, seventeen right. years old. Jeez. And. Uh, you you do what you got to do, and I'm sure if I'd have needed to shoot that M16, I mean I looked at it, and, and it's a it's it's a weapon, and, and I'm I'm a shooter. I was a shooter in high school, shot guns and 22s and, and rifles and stuff like that, 30 out sixes. So I I knew how to shoot a gun, and in, in basic training they showed you yeah. how to shoot a gun. Yeah. But due to the fact that I was never going to be uh, exposed to a hand-to-hand -hand combat or or infantry or anything like that, there was no need to train me. I mean, we would go back and, and shoot 45s and stuff like that, but I, I never shot a shot anything but a 45. So, hmm. boy, and to be the, the thick of the Tet Offensive—that's uh, well. Could, could you see activity going oh, on in there around the yeah, city? And uh, every and I was on, on guard duty every night. That was my my shift. And you would there's what they call parachute flares, and, and what it is, it's a mm -hmm. it's a parachute with a with a bright flare on it mm -hmm. that will light up a large area. For the for the infantry or whoever is looking for uh, the enemy to come in, will light up that particular area, and then you would you ever heard of a, a, a tracer? It's a, every fifth round. It's a it's a red colored bullet, you know, and you you would see that. So you'd see small arms arm fire, and you would hear uh, shells landing and, and being sent in. So you knew all around Saigon that there was heavy activity. One night in the barracks uh, when I wasn't on duty, this is like the second day we got there. Uh, we heard machine gun fire and, and uh, we had no idea what it was. We were all asleep. And then somebody came running into our, our building area and said, everybody hit the deck. Uh, Charlie's on the ground in the, in the property, in the building. Two, uh, two officers didn't get killed that night. Uh, they were on the lower floors. We was up a couple floors. And here again, we, we were unarmed. We had we had no, no weapons to, to defend ourselves. So it was just 50, 60 guys just huddling on the floor, pulling their mattresses over them, and a mattress is not going to do you any good, but uh, that's the only thing we can do. Wow. wow. So, you know, uh, but here again, what I what I did in the service, I, I really enjoyed, and, and uh, I'm just so thankful for all the men and women that, that gave their lives, and out of 58,000 men that lost their lives, uh, I think it's six of them were women who were taken care of probably nurses. We just had that read at the, at the Veterans uh, Club uh, Monday, uh, the number of uh, KIAs, and, and uh, I think it was six of them were women. So uh, thank goodness to all my, all my service members wow. who, who, gave, who gave all. Yeah, right, so, right, right. So later on, I, I got discharged, and, and uh, after my discharge, I moved back home to Birmingham, Colorado, and got a job with... Uh, now you had said earlier off camera that uh, you got a discharge, uh, financial discharge, because you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had asked the Navy to help me out financially, in in ways that I could uh, pay pay bills and and make sure that my wife and daughter were taken care of. Now right. that I was a family man, my wife was going to be okay, but now I got a baby and she was unable to work because of the baby, and uh, she was in Goodland, Kansas. That's where she was staying with her mother, trying to to, to make ends. So. I asked the Navy and there was nothing they could do. Well, I worked with this, this uh, E-5 personnel, uh, personnel man, yeoman, and uh, he said, let me do some check-in. And so within probably 30 days after I told him about that, he came and said he had written some letters and, and stuff like that and got some information back. And, and uh, 
they granted me a, a, a hardship discharge, which got me out three months early. So I didn't full serve a full four years. It was uh, three months and yeah. three, three years, years months. and, and uh, seven months. So, it, but still, so when I got out, uh, uh, it was it was good that I got to see my family. That's where I said met my daughter after three months. So, but it was it was. I wouldn't have done it if, if any other way. Yeah, right. But I just I just didn't have the money and I sure. just needed to get a job. Oh, so. fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So after after the Navy, it uh, I got a job working for my uh, a friend of mine from high school who was a an Army veteran who had been win wounded in Vietnam and was a Purple Heart recipient, and uh, he got me a job with his dad and, and we built sugar beet equipment in uh, eastern Colorado and, and uh, during sugar beet season we would drive trucks and mm -hmm. and uh, go out in the fields and get sugar beets and, mm -hmm. and then we'd do the rehaul and stuff like that so during my time with the uh, with the sugar beet company I uh, or equipment company I applied for the Colorado State Patrol and, and passed the test but didn't score high enough to get put on the, uh, the patrol or get the academy so we had my my aunt my, my mom's my mom's sister said that uh, she had an opportunity to get, get a job out there in a new town in Nevada that uh, was just starting to boom and it would be a good good start for a young young couple and so went out there and it was it was a disaster. Oh really? Huh? It, it really was. <laughs> uh, we, we had, I mean I was a plumber's assistant, I was a cab driver, I worked in a bar, and the cab driver I, I my, my best Customers were were prostitutes, and because Nevada was prominent with prostitutes, mm -hmm. and uh, God, they they were great girls. I mean, but they had sad stories. And I heard every one of them, and uh, knew them just by the cab company, but yeah. uh, knew them by first names. And uh, the day that my wife and I was getting ready to move back to Colorado, we was leaving Nevada. She was in a beauty shop getting her hair done. My wife was. And when I came, and she was pregnant with our second child, mm -hmm. very noticeably pregnant, and uh, all these beauticians saw me bring her in, and cute little couple, you know, and a brand new, you know, mommy, and uh, I had my daughter with me, an older daughter, and so when I came back to pick her up, there was one of the prostitutes in there. <laughs> well, when I walked in, she hollers, she says, Bart, how are you doing? Well, every beautician in there, and every other lady, knew this girl was a prostitute. I didn't think anything about it really until later. <laughs> I said, oh, hi, Sonny, how are you? And all we visited a little bit, and I went over and said hi to my wife, and all these women are just staring at me and shooting daggers at me. They're thinking, I know this girl <laughs> yeah, professionally, right. Right. and here I got this pregnant wife, and how terrible of a guy I was. My wife and I have laughed about that for, for quite a few years. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that story time to time. But Anyway, came back to Colorado and, and uh, got a job with a detective agency in Greeley. And while I was with that detective agency, I took the Colorado State Patrol test again. This time, passed it high enough to where I got accepted into the academy. In June of 1973, I started a 20-year career with the Colorado State Patrol. Wow. So uh, my first duty assignment was uh, Broomfield, Colorado, and uh, worked in Adams County for... Uh, close to 17 years, uh, worked auto theft, uh, worked the state fair for 10 years because the, the, the state fair is state property and, and they wouldn't have the police department or they didn't have jurisdiction or the sheriff's department so the state patrol had to do all the police activity mm. for the state fair. So I did that for 10 years, it was two weeks at a time and that was tough separation from the family but here again it was kind of like the, the military, you had, to, you had a duty to right. perform something and you did. So uh, pretty much after 17 years, I, I took the sergeant's test several times and, and never scored high enough on that to, to get promoted. But in, uh, I guess, November of, I guess September of 87, I, I passed the test and was promoted and, and, and transferred up here to Loveland. And that's where I ended up my career and, and uh, retired. After 22 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It was a good career. I, I, here again, uh, you don't make a lot of friends when you're in law enforcement because nobody wants to see those lights coming in behind you or hear a siren pulling you over and, and 
either chewing you up, giving you a ticket, or arresting you. So you didn't you didn't make a lot of friends. But I I look at my career on the state patrol that uh, I for what I did, the tickets I wrote, the people I talked to, uh, I know in my own mind I saved an awful lot of lives. Really? Yeah. Oh, excellent. That's that's the way I look at it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they might not think of it at the time they was getting the ticket, but I hope because of that ticket that I wrote or somebody else wrote in law enforcement that they said to themselves, I learned my lesson and I don't need to do this anymore because it was dangerous and because of that police officer, uh, I, I might be okay from here on out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Might have worked, some of them might have got worse. Uh, one story on a, on a bad note is, is I did write a kid a ticket one night. He was bought a brand new motorcycle, brand new Harley Davidson and he was just hot rodding up and down the streets of, of Adams County and I stopped him and wrote him a ticket for improper motorcycle riding because there's a law for that. And it was m multiple things he was doing. I didn't write careless driving. I just wrote improper riding a motorcycle. And uh, he said, well, he said, this is my first day and I'm going to enjoy it. I said, well, just, just keep in mind, you know, there's, there's other people out here, other law enforcement officers out here, and I'm going to be out here until 3 o'clock in the morning. So I said, I don't want to see you twice. Well, unfortunately, I did see him twice. As I got off duty at 3 o'clock in the morning, I had heard a dispatch call of a car motorcycle accident on a certain road that I had patrolled. And I went there, and, and it was this kid. He was driving down this road, and he lost control, hit the back of a parked pickup with a camper on it, and he died. Mm. And uh, later on, I found out his blood alcohol was twice the legal limit, so he not only was he careless, he was drinking too yeah. later on. And uh, my ticket was found in his wallet during the investigation. So I was called in to testify. And uh, I was asked that during the testimony by the district attorney if he'd been drinking. I said, not at the time. I said, if he would have, I'd have probably taken different action against him yeah, other than yeah. the, the ticket. I'd have probably uh, towed his motorcycle and, and probably arrested him, but they, I said there was no indication of alcohol, I didn't smell anything, and he didn't act uh, inebriated, so I, I just wrote the ticket for what I, what I, what I saw. So, What, what about on the, on the dangerous side of things, what about the other side of the fence? Did you ever, you think at times where you were in what you considered dangerous situations, or was... There were, there were two, two times that I, I had a gun pulled on me, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, one was, I... I was doing an accident report on the side of a, uh, a street in Thornton. It wasn't even my jurisdiction, but it was in Adams County, so I had the, the right to be there. And, uh, excuse me. So I was doing this report and I, I heard this crash. So I, I looked up and I saw these two cars separating, so there was a side swipe. So I, I saw the one pull over and the other one didn't. So I just threw my paperwork over the passenger seat and took off and notified the dispatcher there had been an accident at uh, 84th and Thornton and one of the vehicles didn't stop and I was going to pursue that vehicle to notify Thornton Police Department. So as I chased this guy and he, he definitely tried to run, it was now a state vehicle, I ran the plate, they got the, the, owner, the registered owner already because of the computer. I finally got him stopped. Well, he, he had tinted windows. The back windows were tinted, the driver's side was tinted, and I had my, my bright spotlight on the left side of my patrol car face to, to his mirror and, and, the, and the driver's door. And as I walked up to the door with my flashlight like this, when the window came down, there was a barrel of a gun pointed at me. And there was two people in the vehicle with him, and I, I just said, boy, I said, uh, <laughs> All you, all you got is a, is a, is an accident right now. I said, if you do anything worse, I said, you're going to have a, a real, real problem. And I said, plus, I said, with that fender the way it is on the right side, it's going to cut your tire in half. He looked away. He turned over and looked at the right side of his car. What he did, I pulled my weapon <laughs> and put it in his head, and I told him, I said, drop the gun, or I said, it's all over. He dropped his gun, and, and that was the end of the story. Uh, the cavalry came in, the Thornton Police Department uh, found me because they knew where I'd stopped because I called it in. So that was one time. And uh, because of the tinted windows, I had to testify before the, uh, the state senate during a hearing about tinted windows, how dangerous they were. And part of my testimony 
uh, created a new law in the state of Colorado uh, for the uh, thickness for the thickness allowed on on windows. You know, uh, backs windows could be darker than the driver's window and things like that. So, I felt good that I I, I helped with making a law get passed because of a situation. Uh, I didn't have too many time to think about that, but it was just something I said that uh, yeah. caught this guy and. And thank goodness he was dumb enough to think that there was really something going to happen because that's the only thing I could think of. Wow, that's some quick thinking. Wow. So another time was at the state fair. Uh, here again, the state fair is pretty much drunks and cowboys and fights and and uh, people jumping fences trying to get in without paying. You know, that's all we're down there yeah. for. Uh -huh. And I got a call. I was a motorcycle rider on, during the state fair, so I got called to go down to the 4-H area because there was some wall jumpers. And uh, <laughs> got down there, stopped my motorcycle, was looking between cars, trying to find the wall jumpers. And all we would do was take them and escort them out yeah. the gate, you know, and, and uh, we couldn't do it on a motorcycle, so we would call the foot patrol in and they would escort them. So the foot patrol knew that they was going to need to come down there, so they was on the way. And uh, as I was looking through the vehicles, I heard a, a thump and a thump. Well. The thump was off of the top of the pickup onto the hood of the pickup right behind me and the guy put a knife to my throat. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know it was a knife because I felt it and I had just a little, little tiny cut, you know, and uh, I said, boy, I said, this is really going to get you in trouble. And I said, you realize, I said, there's two guys behind you right now, again, quick-witted, and he turned around and I got him in the rib with my, my, my right arm and down he went and, and uh, we arrested him and, and, and put him in jail. You know? But that's the only two times. There was, other, there was other times that uh, there were some high speed chases and, and some wrestling matches and stuff like that. And, and I didn't like wrestling matches because, boy, I tell you what, uh, their adrenaline is, is crazy because they're usually wanted mm. and they, they've got a reason to get away. Mm and uh, they're going to do whatever they can. And we had cross-draw weapons on the state patrol at that time, so my weapon was ex accessible to them because they'd get a hold of the handle. That was always, always a problem with our office, officers. We always said we didn't like that. We wanted the, the gun away, and they finally changed that. But, uh, so you're thinking about that in a wrestling match and getting down there. And uh, so the few of those that I, I had, and then you lose you, you you lose your wind. You're tired and stuff like that. You finally get them arrested. Then you get on your radio. We didn't have handheld radios. You get on your radio, call your dispatch, and you're winded because you didn't you you didn't have a chance to call them and tell them that you was in a fight. Yeah. Because you didn't have that radio saying I'm in a fight. Said help. <sighs> they knew my location, but yeah. everything was okay. Because right, every right. time you stopped a car, you gave the dispatcher your location just in case something would happen. Okay. Last known last last known mm -hmm. location. So I get on the radio and I'm, I'm breathing heavy. They would panic. They well, they wouldn't panic. Dispatchers didn't panic. They would get excited. They'd say, "One bank of water. Are you okay? Uh, what's going on? You're breathing heavy. Give me a minute. Let me regain my composure. You know, I'll, I'll kill you in just a minute." Then, then you would tell them everything's fine. I just had an altercation with a with a suspect and he's he's uh, he's arrested and everything's okay. So, but you know, there there were several of those. But other than that, my my duty on the state patrol was pretty good. Uh, I, I always thought. I mean, I always thought. Of, uh, I think of a state patrolman that every single stop, there's always got to be that that certain as you're approaching the car. Every time you, there's that wonder what what you're going to come up on. And there is yeah. every time. Yeah. You treat every every driver of every car as being a suspect and possibly a danger. Mm. That's the way you're taught. Mm. If you if you think it's a little old lady from Pasadena and she's a sweetheart, yeah. uh, you're you're going to get yourself hurt. And we've yeah. we've had officers die because of their lack of focus and uh, we lost a, 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 an officer out in Lyman because uh, he got uh, somebody got the drop on him and he had a secondary weapon the guy got his gun away from him but he had a secondary weapon pulled it and shot and it didn't go off and the bad guy says well uh, you're taking this game to another note so he took his weapon and shot him oh, and wow. killed the officer wow. and uh, so there was there were several state patrolmen lives lost while I was on the on the state patrol one of them was Tom Carpenter in 1974. I just I was just out of the academy, been out for about a year on my own for just two weeks, working a six to two shift. I was working the Boulder Turnpike between I-25 and the Broomfield exit, and he was working I-25 from 
58 during rush hour traffic. And during that time, he pulled in behind a car uh, that was had the hood up, and he it was on it was on my ramp as my turnaround area. So he got there before I did, and he was accosted by by two guys taken out to Montbello, which is out off I, I 70 Peoria, and and shot with his own gun in the back of his head, and he was killed. Mm. And this was two weeks after I was on my own, so that was that was an eye opener. That uh, that made me think, boy, this is this is this is not. Uh, this is not the movies. This is serious, because we had had coffee that morning. I knew him. He was a he was a friend of mine, fellow patrolman, and and uh, uh, tell the story that all the uh, officers were told to go to the telephone and call dispatch before we before it was aired that Tom Carpenter had been shot and killed. So each one of us made that phone call. And we found out that Tom Carpenter had been shot and killed, and we was in a manhunt right now. But we was going there's going to be a a news clip coming out that there had been a state patrolman shot, no name. But we were supposed to call all oh, of our wives oh, and right, mothers yeah. and fathers, whoever, if we were single, the next of kin, saying, you're going to hear about a state patrolman, it's not me. Right, right. So when I called my wife, you know, I said, Tom Carper has been shot and killed. So when you hear about that, it's not me. I'm okay. So, uh, and then my, my two little girls, especially my oldest one, uh, his picture was shown in his uniform. Well, it was just like Daddy's uniform. So she would always say, "There's Daddy's friend. There's Daddy's friend," because she was just learning how to talk, not knowing why yeah. his picture was. Oh, on good. There. So, yeah. wow. So that's 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 pretty much my career. And, and so it was a good, uh, all in all, a good yeah. twenty-two year career. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Enjoyed enjoyed my my life with the state patrol. Uh, good camaraderie. So, yeah. Yeah. and then after that, I just started doing odds and ends jobs and. And looking for something to keep money coming in. Now I'm working for a helicopter company in Fort Collins, and been there for eight years. And I'm really looking to retire. I've I've, I've served my time. Fair enough. I'm yeah. getting yeah. close to it, and, and uh, would like to sit back and kick my feet up and get some hobbies going. Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, just a few questions, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll uh, in in the interview. Going back, you you know, particularly uh, coming up back from tours and, and the times that you go back and forth to see your, your father, you mentioned that, that you didn't have any uh, civilian clothes. Did you have any troubles, uh, like through airports and the like with, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Vietnam was an ugly, ugly situation, which the, the American people didn't realize or didn't care or whatever. I'm not sure what it was. But it was it was a it was a draft military. Uh, I volunteered, but I got drafted. Right, I volunteered, right. and so what I what I did was was my choice. If I would have got drafted, it would have been their choice. I would have done what they wanted me to do. But Vietnam veterans were tagged pretty early in the '60s as being baby killers and and. Uh, all kinds of other things. So when I hitchhiked, as a matter of fact, something I didn't say is when, when I left Denver after seeing my dad the first time I came back, my only transportation was either a bus or a cab, but I couldn't afford that. Right. And buses, I didn't go to close to a bus station. So I went out on Ice Avenue and hitchhiked. Wow. And uh, first time I'd ever did that in my life. So had just a small little satchel with me and my uniform and my thumb. The first guy that I saw was in a pickup and he stopped and, and I thought, hey boy, how lucky am I? Real quick. Well, I ran to his pickup and as soon as I got to his back fender, he's peeled out his tires. I can't say that he did that because he didn't like my uniform, but I don't know any other yeah, reason. Right, right. Uh, I don't think that he would have had any reason to be afraid of me. Uh, I don't know what he looked like, how old he was, uh, I could have been more afraid of him, you yeah, know. Yeah. But anyway, so that was my first first experience. Then I was in an airport, and, and uh, I got called many, many names and baby killers, and and uh, it was it was not pretty. And today, uh, people are starting to recognize the Vietnam veterans, and I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to say this in a derogatory way, but I. It's a little too late, 
and it's mostly the young people who are getting a better education than their parents and grandparents were getting back in the 60s. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not mad at them. I'm sorry that they, uh, they do what they do. As a matter of fact, one thing I will show, I carry this in my car, and every time I see a Vietnam plate, just Vietnam right now, I, whether they see it or not, I, I, I hold it up in my, oh, my right nice. window or my left window, wherever, which way I'm passing, and I'm hoping to get something started. I haven't seen the second welcome home sign yet, but I'm trying to get something started to where Vietnam veterans will take a 10 minutes to make a piece of cardboard and uh, print out a piece of paper, put tape on it, and uh, eventually I'm going to start doing it to every military plate I see, no matter what, because as far as I'm concerned, if they serve in the military, they need a welcome home, and that's what I'll do. But I want to, I want to start with the Vietnam vets because when I see a World War II or a Korean, I will thank them for their service. But if I see a, a, somebody with a Vietnam hat, I'll say, welcome home. Right, right. There's a little bit of difference, and I'm not right. taking anything World War II. Right. Korea, no, Korea the, the Korean vets, uh, we call that the forgotten war. Uh, they weren't mistreated, but they, they were not treated. They were not welcomed home like World War II vets and the World War I vets. And uh, now I'm so proud that the, the men and women from Iraq and Afghanistan, when they come home, I mean, you see people, yeah. videos and YouTubes and stuff like that, of people yeah. clapping, patting them on the back, shaking their hands, and, and boy, I'll do the same thing. Yeah. And uh, whenever I see a, a, a person in uniform, I've got a great niece that's in Korea right now. She's a career lady, and I, I boy, I thank her every time I see her. Yeah. But uh, they they need to be thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, I, I don't... Talk about that too much, but uh, yeah, it was it was sad. Yeah, it wasn't our fault. Right, we, right. we didn't start the conflict. Right. It was it was not our choice, uh, but we did the best we could. Yeah, and there was there were some bad things that was done over there. Our military probably did some terrible, terrible things to uh, some some maybe some innocent people. I I wasn't. Uh, Privy to that, so I don't know for sure what they did. Yeah, yeah. I know there was a, a the Mila massacre, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Kelly. I don't know exactly what happened there. I just know that uh, most likely Lieutenant Lieutenant Kelly was following orders, and uh, with some of the history that I've, I've read, and I knew that uh, some of the small children would come up with dolls and they would have bombs in them and they would detonate them and take out two or three of our people or more. Uh, we didn't know who to who to who to trust. Right. It wasn't like Korea and, and Vietnam; they exactly. weren't uniforms. Right, and there, there wasn't, wasn't a line. front line. Yeah, there yeah. wasn't a line. Yeah, and the jungles. It was uh, it was pretty tough, you know, jungle. So, what our what our men did over there, uh, God bless them. What are your thoughts uh, through the years? Uh, Thinking back, you know, when you're in the thick of it, your thoughts on the war, and, and as time has passed, and you, you know, history's come out, and, and just times passed. How has your thought about the Vietnam War changed or progressed, or, or has it pretty much stayed the same? Well, it's over. Uh, why we were there is is probably the biggest controversy. Uh, did we have a right to be there? Uh, it wasn't like World War II where we had allies that were coming in and everybody was participating to protect England and, and America and, and stuff. but. The way, I, the way I look at it, it's, it's no different than what we have with Afghanistan and Iraq. If we don't take the war to them, they're going to bring the war to us. If, if our government decides that there's something that we need to do as a military body to protect the American people from whatever it is, whether it's war on terror or, or whatever it is, uh, we as the United States American military people have a, have a duty to, to go and, and do whatever it takes to get, get the job done. Uh, World War I and World War II was, was win, win, wins for us. Korea and, and Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, there was no winners, you know. Uh, it's just been, been, been terrible. Uh, whether the presidents were right by uh, going to Congress and declaring war, that's not for me to say. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not a member of Congress. I'm not a president. But uh, I, I look at it as as we were asked to do a job, and, and we did it, whether whether it was right or wrong. Yeah. We, we we didn't think it was right at the time. 
We didn't we didn't like it. We didn't think we should be there. We we made our own voices heard from time to time. Uh, some of them evaded the draft. Some of them went to Canada. Uh, I'm sorry that they did that. That's not what I would have done, and I didn't do. And I'm sorry that there there's those people out there, but I'm sure they're back home now. But uh, uh, shame on them. Yeah. yeah. But no, it's uh, uh, I I accept it for what it was, and uh, can't do anything about it. But uh, I'm still proud to have been a member of the military and and uh, did what I could do to, to to help support the support the cause. Yeah. And what about the experiences you had there? I mean, in particularly unloading uh, the bodies and guarding the bodies and such. And uh, those are experiences. Thank God, most of us will never experience. Was there any uh, have any lingering effects? You know, we talk about PTSD and such. I mean, is that were you able to put that behind, or is that still is that still in in your psyche, or uh... it's behind me? Uh, I never had sleepless nights. Uh, I I tried to block out, and I, I I I'm saying this today. I don't I don't know what I was thinking then. It's been long enough ago, but I but I'm pretty sure I I probably once I got off duty and went about my business and. Those those men were, were taken and, and brought home. Uh, I just did my next job. Uh, I I know a lot of lot of veterans that do have post traumatic uh, symptoms, and uh, they're shell shocked. They mm -hmm. they have uh, nightmares, and uh, some of them didn't get treatment. Some of them did. A uh, lot of lot of men today are experienced. Uh, problem with H and Orange. Uh, I just found out this week, talking to a person that uh, the Valley Forge and the Paul Revere that I was on uh, were in Vietnam at the time H and Orange was being used, and our ship was both of them were exposed to that mm -hmm. that chemical. Uh, I've got some symptoms. I will follow through with whatever I need to do to find out if those symptoms are related to uh, the time that I was in Vietnam. Uh, but I've got a friend that I grew up with in high school. There's 12 symptoms. He's got 11 of them. And uh, he's, he's on a disability right now. He's uh, still alive. He's got some problems he's dealing with. But here again, I, I, I think every veteran in any conflict whatsoever, if they've got anything that uh, is wrong with them, they need to ask the government to, to help them. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and it's tough. Yeah. I hear, I hear how long it takes, and it's always a joke about, boy, if you're going to wait from the government, you're going to wait a long time, and it's true. So I'm not, I'm not worried about pension. I'm not worried about compensation, but if I have something wrong with me, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take a look and see what I get to, to help me. Absolutely. I just recently had uh, three stents put in the, the third of September, uh, two arteries that uh, got, got clogged with, with plaque. And uh, what's well, one of the symptoms of Agent Oish is, is heart disease, so I'm going to I'm going to invest in that and find out what's going on. So, but uh, there's a lot 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 worse than me. Wow. So, yeah. but no, it uh, uh, I can't remember what you asked. No, just ask it if you had any lingering oh, symptoms. Yeah, from no, the, no, no mental, no yeah. mental. Uh, yeah. I had I had. Probably more from the state patrol. Mm. Yeah, well, that's some, some, yeah. some times that uh, were a little bit closer related, uh, but nothing, nothing from Vietnam. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that because uh, so, so many, so many when men, men came back, and they're either homeless, uh, mm -hmm. drunks, drug addicts, mm -hmm. uh, didn't know how to get help, didn't ask for help, didn't have anybody that would offer help, and. Uh, I'm very sorry for them. I, I, I've seen many of them, and they, they're, they're terrible looking. Uh, one of my daughters sent a, a Facebook thing the other day about a, a Vietnam veteran who was homeless, and something miraculously came to somebody came to his aid and took him off the streets, got him a job, cleaned him up, and you look at him as a homeless. You look at him today, and you would never know that they were the same person. Mm. So. Thank goodness that there, there, something like that happens. It's, it's good. Yeah. You know, so. 
through the years, did you uh, keep in touch with anybody you served with, or was there any sort of like ship reunions or anything like that? Uh? There are hundreds and hundreds of ship reunions. I didn't get involved in anything until this year. I had uh, a phone call from a friend of mine on the on the Paul Revere, and he had did some searching on the internet and found my name, mm -hmm. found out because I'm, I'm I'm in the telephone book, yeah. so. I'm accessible, yeah. and he called and talked to my wife one night, and she said, do you know this guy, and gave me his name, and I said, wow, yeah, 43 years. <laughs> so I, I talked with him, and, and we're talking about a reunion. With him, I met other people off the same ship, so we've got a reunion that we're thinking about doing in 2014, with so far like 10 or 12 of us that were on the ship at the same time. The ones I really, really want to me with as a Valley Forge mm -hmm. because I was on there longer, right, right. knew more of them. Right. Uh, last year, I don't know if you ever heard about the Sweetheart Contest with Reporter Harold. There was a contest on the best love story. Mm. And uh, my wife and I put our love story. Basically, it was about meeting in, the, in Burlington on my leave and that whole story I just said. Yeah. Well, it came in second place, okay? The one came in first place, the, one of the sons had cancer, and uh, their story was, to me, a winner. I, 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 I didn't mind coming in second to them, <laughs> but we had fun doing it. We had a lot yeah. of votes. It was a, a vote on, on, on the internet type uh -huh. thing. Well, they, their social media was bigger than mine, <laughs> because I would make 20 votes, they would make 50 votes. So <laughs> it was, but it was fun watching this battle, and everybody was calling me and texting me, and I. I said, don't do this while I'm at work. I'm, I'm trying to stay busy. <laughs> when, uh, when I was on this contest, my picture was in there. Well, a, a friend of mine who was on the Valley Forge was talking to his, he tells me the story, I found out later, he tells me the story. He's talking to his cousin on the telephone. He's talking about this cruise ship that uh, went over on its side in Spain or wherever it was. And it was sitting out there for, for, it's still there, I think. Oh, yeah, okay, the one in, in Italy. Off oh, Italy, yeah. Italy, Italy, that's where it was. And he said, the only cruise ship I would get on, and he punched up the Valley Forge, would be this one. And when the Valley Forge popped up, I'm, I'm a member of the Valley Forge hall number, my picture popped up with my wife. <laughs> oh, wow. And this is 43 years after yeah. we was on the, on the Valley Forge. He recognized my picture from 43 years later. Wow. And he called the reporter, Harold, he said, would you please find out if it would be okay if I contacted this Bart Bartholomew, I think he just shipped me. Well, to kind of cut down the story is, is uh, he called, or I, I called him and found out I knew him, he was a member of Combat Cargo, and we worked together, and uh, he said, uh, well, do you live in Loveland now? I said, yeah. He said, where is I told him? He says, well, I live over on such and such. I said, where? He says, on such and such. I said, well, I said, I lived on Lilac Place for six years, seven houses away. Wow. We had been in the same town for over 25 years, five blocks from each other, five houses from each other for six years and didn't know it. I walked by his house when we walked. He walked by my house when he walked. We just <laughs> weren't out at the same time. Right. And so, and we're, we have coffee all the time, we go out to dinner all the time, so yes, the camaraderie is great, it's just fantastic wow. that we have met each other, and uh, I got a Valley Forge hat that I had made for him, and made for me in a couple t-shirts here recently, so we could be brothers, yeah. you know, uh, with our shirts and hats. Wow. So that was pretty, pretty cool. So yeah, we're, I mean, there's reunions going all the, all the time, and I'm a member of the, what they call the PAM Vets, it's Proud American Veterans. Mm -hmm that had a breakfast every Saturday morning. We were at the Wood of McCoy's and, and now we're at Dorothy's and Dorothy's Catering and uh, there are between 75 and 100 guys that uh, show up. Most of it's about 75 people show up every every yeah. every morning. Some of the guys bring their wives yeah. and there's still some god awful wonderful Viet or World War II veterans yeah. that still come down there. Some of them can't get along too good but somebody brings them and that's just wonderful because the, the greatest generation are still my heroes. They're, yeah. They're pretty wonderful guys. <laughs> wow. Well, Bart, as we as we narrow or wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any of the stories that have kind of floated to the top of we've been talking here? So that ideally, we I know we're not getting all of your story, but hopefully, rounding out as best we can. Or do you think we've done a pretty good job? I think we pretty much covered it. I mean, uh, well, the last question I do like to ask with with these uh, interviews is. 
How do you think that period of time uh, in the Navy and in, in, in general, uh, Vietnam in particular, played a role in your life, affected your life, changed your life, or did it? Or was it just simply a chapter in your life that you went through? How would you, how would you answer that? That's a very good question. I got a very good answer. If it wouldn't have been for the Vietnam War, I keep saying war, I'm sorry for that. Politically correct is conflict, police action. Uh, I probably wouldn't be the man I am today. Really? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I went in as a 17-year-old boy, and I came out probably as a as a 19-year-old man. Uh, and if I would have stayed in civilian life, uh, 19 years old, I'd have probably still been a boy. Uh, 20, I'd have probably still been a boy. Uh, gosh, how I don't know how old I would have been. I don't know if I would have got married if I'd have stayed. Uh, uh, 60s were a, were a hippie generation, and there was a lot of a lot of wild stuff going on in the 60s. And uh, I chose the other other route. Military kind of forced me into that, but I don't mind. So I think I think I can really say honestly that uh, my military experience, uh, as well as I think a lot of men and women, changed them from young adults to young kids, mm -hmm. teenagers to young adults real quick. You had to learn how to, number one, take care of yourself. Uh, even though the, the military was there to, to, to feed you and clothe you, uh, you pretty much had to do an awful lot of stuff on your own. You know, you was guided, but those those men and women that were in Vietnam uh, or Korea or World War II, you know, they were out there in the fields. Uh, there was no nobody saying, okay, here's how to clean your gun, mm -hmm. here's how to point the gun. You was you you did what you had to do, yeah, and that's what yeah. I was saying when I was at the embassy. Yeah, boy, can I? I'm not sure I could have, yeah. but I didn't have to have that chance or that didn't need to do that. So uh, I I always tell people this too: I can't get divorced. I just can't get divorced because I don't know how to take care of myself. From birth to 17, my mother took care of me and fed me and clothed me. <laughs> the Navy took care of me until I got married, and while I was married, my wife and the Navy took care of me, and the wife's been taking care of me ever since, so if I don't have a wife for the Navy or my mom, I, I can't take care of myself, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> well, well, we'll wind down this interview. I want to thank you for telling your, your, sitting down to tell your story today. Uh, more importantly, though, I want to thank you for your service to our country, and I don't know if I've got a right to say it as a non-Vietnam vet, but uh, welcome home as well. Well, you betcha, you do. And thank you very much for, for saying that because uh, every Vietnam veteran appreciates being welcomed home. Very good. Thank, thank you, Bart. All right. Thank you, Brad. Well, Brad, what I got here is a, a book that I've been starting to put together uh, of my military. Uh, I pretty much don't have my basic training. I just started with the Valley Forge. So uh, as I progress with this little book, it's probably going to become a bigger book. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have more pictures in it. But uh, right now, it's pretty much all the Valley Forge. So this is the aircraft carrier that I was on. It's called an amphibious assault ship. Uh, in World War II, it was a fixed-wing aircraft carrier, carrier, and in the 60s, uh, they converted it to a, uh, a landing platform helicopter ship. So that's why it went from a CVA-45 to a LPH-8. So these are uh, some of the uh, awards that it was given uh, while it was uh, in Vietnam, and pretty much I'm going to focus pretty much on all Vietnam. So sure. now I'm going to go through the book itself and show you some of the pictures. Okay. Um, this is the first page. It's not very good. It's a copy of a copy of a copy sent on the internet, so uh, the picture's not too good. But when I was assigned to the Valley Forge, uh, we went through a, a captain change. And this is an invitation of uh, one captain taking over for another captain. And uh, real quickly, I'll just mm -hmm. flip this over and see if I can get it in there. Yep, perfect. I worked, uh, my first captain was was Captain pa Carr, and then uh, Captain Payne was uh, my captain for my first year. They would change commanding officers every year, so it would just be a 12-month uh, uh, commanding officer type thing. So uh, 
December of 67 to December of 69, Captain Carr was my skipper, so. Did, did you have a favorite of all the ones that? Uh, no, you, yeah. you did you really didn't get to know the, yeah. the skipper too much because he was too much of a high command, but uh, we'd have inspections and stuff like that, and he would come by, and uh, Captain Payne was very personable, uh, so uh, he, he seemed like a pretty good skipper. All in he, all. He got us there and back. All in all, yeah. respect for uh, you command. Betcha. Yeah. Okay. You betcha. Okay. Well, uh, for who can see me now, this is what I look like in 1967 or 68, so I was probably 17 or 18 years old there, so uh, just a little bit of change. Hmm. Okay, what I have here is uh, it's going to be kind of hard to see, but this is the, the Valley Forge during Korea, CVA 45 here. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's two five-inch gun turrets mm -hmm. on the front of the forecastle. It's called a forecastle, and there's two five-inch guns on the back of the forecastle. Well, during the conversion from a fixed-wing aircraft carrier, they took out this hangar deck. This is a, not a hole because it got hurt. It's a hole because a, a flight deck, this, this, or this uh, elevator, goes down right. as well as right here. Well, when they converted it, they, they, they took one of the... 50 or 5 inch guns off the front and one of the 5 inch guns off the back. So this is the CVA 45, this is the LPH 8, and nothing but helicopters on at that time. Hmm. That must have been fascinating to watch too, uh, the, the operations of helicopters and, and such flying off and on. And uh, I think that would have been, to me, would have been fascinating to watch the whole operation. And We had we had more than one type of helicopter too, and I'll, I'll show you a, a couple of the helicopters that was uh, part of the, the Marine Corps unit. But uh, the, the CH-46s, which I'll show you later, they were the troop transports and cargo transports. And then we had what we called Huey helicopters. And Huey helicopters were more of a, of a gunship. Uh, they had machine guns on them. Well, the, the 46s did too. Uh, there, was a, there was a gunner on the, on the, probably on the port and starboard side of that ship. But uh, uh, the Huey pilots were the ones that really got into some heavy combat and and most of, uh, more of them got shot down than the CH-46s, and uh, uh, we have I have visions of like you asked helicopters coming in and going out. Uh, boy, I tell you, it was just fast and furious because sometimes they just came in for fueling and equipment or some cargo, or they needed to take something back in, and uh, it, it was fast. We put more ammo on them, so it was. Uh, Fast and furious from time to time. So, but yeah, it was interesting. And and when when we was idle, uh, we're just sitting out there waiting for something to happen, and then you'd hear in the distance. And that was a that was a Huey. You yeah. could you could really tell a Huey, uh, and we call it the Italian helicopter because it went wop 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 wop. <laughs> so, and then the CH forty sixes were were a distinct sound too, but. Uh, but when you heard that, you knew that you had incoming. Yeah. You knew it might be a, a, a medevac helicopter with a red cross on it that's got casualties on it. Uh, but you didn't know for sure. Then you would get instructions from your CO or the flight deck that would tell my captain, Captain Puckett, what's going on. And then he would get us all together and say, okay, here's what we got to do. Here's what we need to get. And then we would get all that stuff together and, and uh, prepare and uh, when we knew he was going to have a big replenishment, we had a lot of heads up time where we get a lot of stuff done. But every once in a while, uh, we would have to get down those cargo holes and get something that uh, wasn't up close to the hangar deck or the, the flight deck. And it most likely was food or, or, food or clothing, you know. So, uh, yeah, pretty exciting. Yeah. Now, would uh, uh, your exposure to Agent Orange, would that be residual stuff on, on the... the the, uh, the the helicopters coming back and clothing and stuff or how was how was that it was it was just the the uh, the chemical in the air with the wind really yeah. oh really okay yeah. Yeah. so the wind uh, would would carry it and that's the way most of the uh, all the veterans because it was targeted to the the Viet Cong up yeah. north okay that's where they was trying to place all this chemical well. You can't allow for the wind, so when, when, it, when it landed there, the wind would pick it up, carry it. Now, it might have been on clothing, and it might have been yeah. in a helicopter. It might have been, you know, uh, not one time for my entire time over there did I ever think about 
this stuff blowing in. It never, it never dawned on me. I never thought about Agent Orange until about a year ago yeah. when somebody said, you got any symptoms of Agent Orange? I said, no, I wasn't in Vietnam. I mean, I was in Da Nang yeah, yeah. several times on the ground. Yeah. I was in Saigon for a couple of weeks, yeah. uh, but I never, never spent time in there. I was never close to the action, so no, I never got it. Amazing. So uh, and then when I found out from this lady from, from Fort Collins, uh, uh, Debbie military, Pierce. yeah, Debbie, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had no idea. She said, just give me the name of your ship and I'll tell you. And I talked to her this week and she says, come in, we got to talk. I said, well, okay, we'll talk. Okay, uh, this is some downtime. This is a CH-46 and I just wanted to pose for a picture. So I just got on the steps. This, this is kind of a, a hatch and steps. It'll mm -hmm. fold up and it'll be halfway and there's another uh, cargo hatch or a hatch that comes down here. But I was just taking a picture. This is a, a member of my, my cargo combat cargo crew when I first got aboard in, in 1967. I'm not going to read their names, but yeah. this is my captain, Captain James Puckett, and this is our gunnery sergeant, Jeff Barnett, and, and then uh, this is me down here in the middle. I, I best, I best explain, I did more than sit on these steps. I, I actually did do some work once in a while, <laughs> but it looks like I, all I found pictures of me was on these steps of these uh, CH-46s. Uh, this is kind of a fun story. This is my cousin Dwight Bennett. Oh, wow. He's my my uh, mother's older sister's son. And uh, this is on the port side of the flight deck of the Valley Forge, uh, close to where my, my sleeping compartments were. But I'm walking across the flight, what, what flight deck one day and I see this guy that kind of looked familiar. He looked really familiar and I walked up to him and I said, Dwight Bennett. He says, yeah. And, and my, my first name is really Marvin, so he said, Marv Bartholomew. And I says, well, I don't go by Marv anymore, but yeah. So he was with the attachment of CH-46s at the time. So we had to spend a few weeks together, uh, chow and, and just kind of hanging around together. So it was kind of ironic that just all of a sudden you find a cousin of yours in Vietnam. Halfway around the world. Halfway <laughs> around the world. <laughs> All right, this is a picture of the, the flight deck on the valley when we're putting some Marine Corps, Marines on, on board uh, helicopters. So this is what they do is they would, they would come out of a, a staging area back here in the, uh, the, the uh, no, I'm not, I can't think of it right now, the, fo the forecastle. No, the forecastle front of the ship. Uh, I'm sorry, can't think of it right now. Yeah. But anyway, they would march out and then they would come straight behind the helicopter and they would get into the back of the helicopter. So this is called a de de debarkation uh, process of, of the guys. And here's one of the five inch guns mm -hmm. that I was talking mm -hmm. about. The front turret and the other one's behind here. Okay, I just remembered what that uh, word is that I was trying to talk about where you saw the brain. It's called a superstructure. Ah, all right. And okay. that's where the uh, uh, captain and, and uh, the coxswain and the boatswain and all those people up there guiding the ship and driving the ship and the, the radar and stuff. But anyway, I can't lay claim to this picture. This is not a picture of me or the Valley Forge that I know of. This is just a picture probably more current of what I did back in the 60s. Now these are two flight deck guys that are hooking up a, a, a cargo pole to the bottom of the CH-46. And what this helicopter will do once it's hooked up, these guys will step away and they'll just go straight up and then they'll fly out. Mm -hmm. And then the next helicopter will come in, hover over, and they'll do the same thing until all these are gone. These cargo nets are all wrapped up and they got four corners like anything else. And they got four steel loops on them. And then you put a clasp around those four steel loops and then you put your hook on there and then you hang that, uh, that, that hook up there. And I'm going to have to tell you because this is my video, but what they call this pole is a donkey dick. <laughs> and uh, I'll just let you take it from there. And if you want to figure out why they call it donkey dick, if not, you can ask me later when you look at my video. Okay, another picture that I can't uh, take credit for or, or say this is on the valley. Uh, number one, all, all our hip helicopters during the 60s were all Marine Corps Green, uh, we didn't have any, this is the Navy helicopter, I can tell you, just because it's gray. But the same thing, this is exactly what they're doing. Unfortunately, when, when I was on the Valley Forge, 
uh, other than the pictures that I show that I'm in it, uh, we didn't really have time to think about taking pictures of, of what we was doing. Uh, I had a video camera hmm. that, uh, an eight millimeter when I was in the Navy. And one picture that I do have that I've shared with my family already is uh, when one of the Marine Corps helicopters was, was flying in with personnel and mail, uh, lost power in one of the one of the engines. I don't know, uh, the engines are both back here, but they lost power and they couldn't get high enough. The, the flight deck's probably some 75, 90 feet above the water. Well, when they was coming in from Vietnam, they just didn't have the power to thrust themselves up to land on the flight deck. So they had to actually throw all the cargo, everything out, including the mailbags, out of the aircraft, and then every member of the, the crew and all the, the people, in fact, the mailman was on there, Mike Pettit, he had to jump out, and then later on, the pilot and the co-pilot had to shut the engines down completely and then jump out and clear the aircraft before it sank. Wow. But I've got that all on, on really? Super, super 8 wow. millimeter. That uh, that I that I've kept and I, I'm, I'm happy for that. But that that's the only thing I got some real, some real action. So that was kind of a cool shot. I can tell you when this is, October 1968, because it says so right there. <laughs> uh, now I'm a man. I'm, I'm now 20 years old. I'm no longer a teenager. <laughs> so uh, I never thought of that until I just started <laughs> thinking about this. But here's here's our Navy helicopter. It was a, a CH-34. Uh, they call it a Choctaw uh, or a, a seahorse, uh, but they had those on the on the Valley Forge before they converted over to CH-46. But this is another picture. Obviously, I'd been doing something, uh, looked like work because I got my shirt dirty. Yeah, yeah. Now uh, you said now you you presently work for the, the helicopter uh, company up in Fort Collins. Has it always been a long lifelong interest in helicopters since then, or is it job related to? In any in any, any uh, respect to uh... no, it uh, it just was by chance oh, okay. that uh, there was a an ad in the paper, and I was I was working, but I was looking, and okay. uh, it uh, said that they needed a receiver because I wasn't a mechanic and I I didn't know how to fix them, but I I knew how to receive. So okay. when I when I saw an opportunity to work for a helicopter company, I said I like helicopters. Okay, and since I've been out there, I got to ride on a few of them and stuff like that. So it uh, turned out to be a pretty good job. Oh, good. This is another picture I can't take credit for because this is probably uh, off of some other vessel. It's, it's definitely not the, the Valley Forge, but this is the kind of ship that the Navy had for a long, long time. Just another picture of me uh, on the flight deck close to where our, uh, our compartment was, where we uh, stayed when we wasn't on the flight deck, so that's all it was. All right. I'd mentioned during the interview uh, when we would do replenishing at sea. Uh, this is the valley, and I can't tell you, I know what two ships they are because they told me when I found it on the internet, but this was just something I found on the internet mm -hmm. that happened in the 60s when we was in Vietnam. But we would be over here in this area right here, or back here, because that's the only place we could take on cargo, and then we would shoot a line over with uh, a, a kind of a little launcher, and then the guys on the other ship would uh, grab it and then tie it off, and then we would be able to bring cargo back and forth. The signalman from here and the signal from here and the signalman for here would talk by using what they call semaphore, and it was something that they would do with their arms and hands and uh, make different positions of their arms and their hands to distinguish different letters, similar to Morse code when they would do the dots and the dashes. Well, that's how they would talk because there was no communication between the ships to speak of, uh, not like it is today. I yeah. mean, you could actually pick up and, and talk to people like you're just next door. So they would communicate to each other and then the signalman would tell whoever they needed to tell what he was saying, so what they would do, and that's how we communicated. That, that whole operation it always amazed me how uh, two ships, I mean, you got different things going on with the, the waves and, and it, it to stay in the same same speed. And particularly, with, it sounded like, particularly when you were transferring fuel, that there was a, actually oh. a very dangerous operation. Well, yeah, you, you, you couldn't, uh, well, even with this, 
you're, you're tied off, yeah. so you have to maintain the same distance between each other all the time because if you got too far away, you would snap a line. If you got too close, you would start sagging, and then it would create problems all around. So, hmm. yeah. Quite an operation. And this is one of the forklifts I, I drove while I was on the flight deck, and uh, we had two on the flight deck, and then we had a great big one that was a equipment mover that uh, could actually lift up a helicopter. And uh, uh, we called it Big Bertha. Wow. I don't, know, I don't think we had a name for this one. All right. I, I like this picture the best of probably all of them. Uh, and the only reason I say that is because uh, when I found this on the Internet, uh, it said circa 67, 68. Uh -huh. Well... I know I was on the Valley Forge during that time, and we was out to sea, and, and there was just a, a boat out there that was taking pictures. And then this is the Thompson. Uh, it's an LSD that uh, was always with us. Whenever we was in Vietnam, she was there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, would, we would just be there all the time together. And uh, so when I saw that, I thought, wow, this is a great one. So when I had the T-shirts made for... Uh, me and my friend that was on the valley, Richard Hopper, uh, I had this picture picked to put on the back of my T-shirt. Oh, wow. So we, would, we could say we was on there when this picture was taken. Yeah, oh, wow. These next two pictures are just other pictures I got off the Internet of the valley. And uh, I don't know when they was taken. I didn't look at the year, but uh, they're just, just shots of them and some are in color. I'll see if I can flip this and see if we can keep... Uh, Yep. Keep going where we don't have to focus too much. But this is, uh, I've, I've been saying starboard and port. Well, this is the starboard side of the ship, which is the right side. And then this is the port side. As a matter of fact, on this picture here, uh, right beside the, the elevator is where my sleeping compartments were. Mm. So I was right across from the superstructure and right next to the elevator. So every time the elevator oh, would... Uh, be engaged, we could hear it, you know, so, then funny about the elevator, there was rails that lifted up and came down every time the elevator was in action, and the rails would, would retract into the, the elevator, as well as the cables too, they would all go into slots, so you never trip on them because they were below the, the surface when, when they were down and they was up so people couldn't get to the end, so. Hmm. And this is a picture pre-67, and, and you can kind of tell the different type of helicopter on here from that CH-46 I told you. Mm -hmm. This is the Choctaw, the CH-34. So I know this is probably in the very early 60s uh, before I got on board. I know this was Long Beach in uh, 1968 when we first came back from our, our first deployment from Vietnam. And uh, my mother, my brother who lived in California, his wife, and my niece and nephew all, uh, all met me at Long Beach. And they came aboard my ship before uh, I took leave. So I know this is a, was a pretty special day to me. Wow. Okay, now this is the, the true story about sailors. <laughs> this is how they partied. Uh, this is two of my real close friends. Uh, neither one of them worked for Combat Cargo. Uh, Jerry Chase was a yeoman. Uh, he worked in the office below decks and, and Gerald Rushing. Uh, I, I, I don't even know where Gerald worked. I just know he was a, was a good friend. And This picture's in uh, Subic Bay, Philippines, uh, probably... December 67 when we when we first ported over there hmm. uh, another party uh, <laughs> different day different bar probably uh, matter of fact this I know I was still a seaman apprentice this had to be in December of 67 when we got to Philippines I worked with this guy here he's Don Chambers worked with this guy Gary Weimer uh, 
I know all the other guys. This is Jerry Chase, but I can't remember the names of them. But I got them on the back, so I, I know who the guys are, but yeah. I just can't remember. But just another party time. Yeah. Uh, geez, partied a lot. I forgot I had this many pictures in here. <laughs> Seemed like I always had a beer in my hand, too. But <laughs> I guess I guess when you was on Liberty, uh, that's what you did. Sure. Uh, this is Gary Weimer. It's kind of funny here. Not funny. It's kind of good. This was Larry Weimer's younger brother who uh, got assigned to the Valley and got assigned to the Combat Cargo. Huh. So, and this is Don Voigt, and this is Sergeant Barnett, and then this is me. This is something I got off the internet. Uh, this shows the, the different classes of, of the Valley Forge. It was a CVA, a CV, a CV, a CVA, and a CVS. And then it became the, the LPH. These are all the, the ribbons that the Valley Forge was awarded during its commission time. And uh, so this is just kind of a, a cover sheet that tells about the, the ship itself. And uh, looking over here, History 1, History 2. These are pages and pages and pages of uh, the history of the Valley Forge. Mm. So uh, no sense looking at them, but I got yeah. some other stuff in the back. Yeah, eventually is uh, sold for scrap, or what's its present status now? Do you have any idea? We always say she was made into razor blades. Oh, okay, <laughs> a lot of razor blades, but yeah, she was decommissioned in uh, in 1970. Oh. It's all in the in the history of mm. it, and uh, uh, I was on board. Probably six months before she was decommissioned, because my wife and I, before we went to the Paul Revere, we stopped by and, and uh, I wanted to get some stuff that I had left on there because I left it here again in a hurry, didn't get to take everything, so I went back to see if it was still there, and they'd already started cleaning everything up. Oh, wow. Was gone. Yeah. Uh, my first certificate from the Navy, uh, while, on, while in boot camp, I was uh, promoted to Petty Officer 3rd Class. Uh, that's the only time I made Petty Officer. I remained a seaman during my entire career, but uh, I was uh, one of probably 13 members of my company that was uh, given the rank of Petty Officer. Hmm. Another proud certificate, that's my discharge uh, when I was released from the Navy. and and uh, showed that I served my, my, my four-year commitment. This is kind of my little shadow box. Mm -hmm. uh, was, was awarded three medals while I was in the service. Uh, the National Defense Ribbon Medal that uh, every member of the Armed Services gets during uh, any kind of conflict or war. And then due to the fact I was in Vietnam, I got the Vietnam Service Medal. And then uh, I had four different campaigns, which is in my DD-214, so I got four stars. Mm -hmm. And then this is the uh, Vietnam Campaign Ribbon and then the medal. So National Defense, Service Ribbon, and Campaign Medal. This is my rank seaman. It was an E3. Uh, there's a picture of me, one of my dog tags, and then I just got some other things in there, flag and a... POW flag and my honorable discharge button, and uh, just a, a Vietnam veteran. Very Vietnam. nice. Very nice. This is my my Vietnam wall in my basement behind the bar. Uh, we'll start at the top. First off, this flag and this uh, award, and Bob Schaefer was a congressman at the time, but my oldest daughter, Derry, uh, contacted the the, the White House and uh, found out that you could get a flag uh, and have it flown over the the U.S. Capitol and then uh, you get a, a letter and a, a commemoration from the your, your local congressman so uh, that's that's my flag that flew over the, the U.S. Capitol oh, nice. and it says down at the bottom for his service in Vietnam and then this is what you've already seen this is yeah. a picture of the Valley Forge and some information about the Valley this is the Paul Revere that I was on, which I don't have in this book, which will be a separate book all itself. Mm -hmm. 
uh, my honorable discharge. I don't have a picture of my uh, my uh, shellback, uh -huh. but this is the the, the golden domain of being in Vietnam, and then this is my order of the mothball that I did with the USS Winston. This swagger stick, I forgot how I got it. Uh, it's got a dragon head, a brass dragon head, a wooden staff, and a brass tip. I got it when I was in Vietnam, and I got it when I was in at the Thompson Air Force Base during Tet Offensive. I don't remember how. Huh. I don't know. Uh, I told the story many times how I got it, but uh, I forgot. I'll be I, 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 what I got to do is I got to uh, take it somewhere and see if someone can maybe identify it or search it on the internet and find out if anybody can tell me what it was, where it came from, see if there's any history behind it. <laughs> but I, I've had it for 40 some years now and I just, <laughs> I just can't explain it. I'll be darned. So it's, it's my loss. A <laughs> uh, couple slides back I just showed you uh, the wall I had in my basement. This is the domain of the Golden Dragon. Uh, just told me my service in Vietnam and it just has a whole bunch of stuff signed by Captain Payne and uh, my my military name, Marvin E. Bartholomew, uh, like I was telling Brad here, I haven't been Marvin since uh, 1967. In the military, uh, you always go by your last name, and they have to call you by your last name. Well, uh, myself and many, many other people in the military had their name shortened just because they couldn't pronounce it. And a lot of the Polish people, like uh, Bagashinsky and Donashinsky, whatever, they all became skis. That's so right. I, I became Barton, and I pretty much kept that forever. Hmm. And this is uh, also the other one, the Order of the Mothball. This is the time I spent on the USS Winston and helped decommission it and clean her up for uh, being destroyed. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd like to talk about this welcome home sign I made. Now this is high tech, very expensive, <laughs> made out of high quality duct tape and cardboard <laughs> and scotch tape. So uh, I spent a lot of money and time on this, and <laughs> but uh, like I, I told you in, earlier in the in the interview, uh, I'm trying to start something. Uh, due to the fact that the Vietnam veterans were uh, not given the the heroes welcome like uh, World War II and World War One, uh, if I could get something like this started by just telling my veteran, my fellow veteran, uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, welcome home like I do when I see them when they got a hat on. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd really like to have that done. It's not that I'm going to uh, set it out on the internet saying everybody from Vietnam carry a welcome home sign, but uh, it's kind of like if somebody sees it, maybe they like the idea and uh, we could all do it. So, But it's kind of hard to uh, be doing that when you're driving down the road, so I don't expect it to, to hit and, and be be a big fad, but uh, uh, I get thumbs up when I when I find a Vietnam veteran because they know exactly what I'm saying and why I have that sign uh, and what I'm doing. So that's what I'll end with, Brad. Very nice, Bart. Thank you.